So it all started um, in before the physics building was actually constructed at Leicester and before chemistry for that matter was there too. So we occupied the ground floor of Fielding Johnson, what is now the admin building. Chemistry were on the first floor. And I can't help thinking that the reason the admin put, were very keen to get those two new science buildings built was so they could move in and take over the Fielding Johnson building. But I'm ne I've never actually checked that with, uh, with the VC. As you'll see, um, I, well, I can say that there, but I started off as a PhD student in the rocket group at UCL, which was one of the original universities involved in this area, studying x-radiation or developing instruments to study x-radiation from the sun, which was thought to have some influence on the heating of the upper atmosphere. Of course, it did. And so, uh, in order because basically UCL was a bit short of space, it was decided that they needed to expand and because I'd made important contacts with Leicester before then, because Leicester happened to have in the physics department some vacuum test facilities that were very useful to what I was doing in my PhD work. So anyway, to get to the bottom line, it was decided that to set up a new research group um, with, as you can see there, a remit to study x-radiation from the sun and other stellar sources. Now, at the time, we didn't know of any other stellar sources that were visible, but we took that on, came here with the Royal Society grant for three years of £13,006. I won't bother telling you where the £6 came from. It might have been Tony Keith, actually. Which, in modern money, is somewhere between a third and a million, a third of a million and a million. Um, I was still writing up my PhD, so it was a busy time when I got here, writing lectures, um, trying to finish up my PhD, and starting a new research group, not aided particularly by the fact that where we were in the on the ground floor of the Fielding Johnson building, there was only one phone, and to get access to that phone, you had to persuade the head of department secretary that calling NASA was actually quite important, <laughs> and then go through the Albert Kinder, who was the blind operator of the switchboard. So if you got through the, the, VC, the head secretary through Albert Kinder, you could then get on to somebody. Could have been at Woomera, where we were trying to launch a Skylark, or could have been at NASA or somewhere else, and make that important contact. So things were different in those days. Obviously, there was no digital electronics, and that was also different. But nevertheless, despite those what seemed like really serious disadvantages, we did seem to manage to get ahead really <coughs> quickly. And without treading on any corns, I think, looking back, one of the reasons was it was in very unbureaucratic. I mean, for instance, if we needed a top-up to our £13,006, all we needed to do, or I needed to do, was get on the phone to the Royal Society, Secretary of the National Committee for Space Research, and say, oh, Philip, Philip Wigley, we're, we're running a bit short. Um, He'll say, well, let me know how much you need, and I'll put it to the chairman of the committee, who happened to be my former prof at UCL, Harry Massey. And that was sorted. So there were good things and bad things compared to now in those days. We came here with two approved science programs. One was to start using the Skylark rocket which was Britain's only space rocket at the time. It had been built at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough out of a surface-to-air missile. And it turned out to be a very competitive uh, in device. And then, more important from a national point of view, the fact that we had a payload on the Aerial 1 satellite, which was the first of a series of small satellites that had been agreed between the UK and NASA in the late 50s. 
As you can see, the first Leicester flight took off, a uh, rather dirty flight. That was the way that the Raven motor tended to work. I think it might worry people these days, certainly st stop you launching from Victoria Park, I guess. <laughs> that was in September 61, when uh, we'd been in existence as a, as a group for just over a year and a half. The payload was very similar to what was on Aerial 5. It was a co combination of our X-ray experiment to look at the sun and a number of instruments to measure the properties of the atmosphere. The military were very interested in the atmosphere at that time, which is one of the reasons, of course, that we were able to get support because just like every other space program around the world, it was a confluence of military and scientific interests that really got things moving. The military interest was that at that time, post-World War II, some of the military strategists thought the next wars might be thought in, in or through space. That didn't happen, fortunately. Anyway, moving on. Um, Aerial 5 got launched and started delivering uh, interesting X-ray data showing how variable the X-ray flux was and that made it really interesting in terms of its control of the uh, upper atmosphere. But we, didn't, we only got about seven weeks of data and then as you'll see in the top bullet point, the US Air Force, who apparently didn't talk to NASA, they tested, it, this was quite illegal at the time, uh, they triggered a hydrogen bomb over the, over the Pacific, Johnson Island Pacific, which filled the radiation, the magnetic field radiation belts with high energy particles, mainly electrons, which got into our detectors. We thought initially that we'd got a short circuit and the detector wasn't work, working. In fact, it was just being uh, swamped by these high energy electrons. We knew that because the Imperial College uh, cosmic ray detector on sitting alongside that was equally affected. Um, the bottom line basically was that we were dead. Uh, the satellite itself became dead a few months later when the solar cells were damaged. The whole thing um, created something of an international incident between Washington and London. And amazingly, showing how disconnected US Air Force and NASA were, five US spacecraft were damaged by the same event. That was the bad news. The good news was the same month, a US Air Force funded experiment to just look and see how, what, were the, what was the X-ray fluorescence from the moon caused by incident solar X-rays because the US Air Force were interested to, to have satellites in space looking for any evidence that the Russians were cheating, <laughs> you know, having done it themselves. Um, anyway, on this, so this rocket, similar to Skylark, was launched at night time, so no sun to see, but they found this incredibly bright source in Scorpius, which turned out to be the first stellar X-ray source, but it was at least, we didn't, know where it was particularly, but if it was any kind of reasonable galactic distance, it meant that the X-ray emission from this star was a million, maybe as much as a billion times more luminous than that of the sun, so this was no normal star. And, well, I just mentioned there that Harold Macmillan had, had a comment for that events, dear boy, he used to say when things went wrong. Boris, Boris ought to use that phrase, I think. Um, that could have been directed at us. There's just a picture that was taken from Hawaii, from Honolulu, about the, the bomb, the so-called Starfish Prime, nothing to do with deliveries from Amazon. Um, and, it, and that comes from a report to Congress, as you see. What, what had happened, like I say, is this... 1.4 megaton hydrogen bomb uh, detonated and filling the magnetosphere with, with particles. 
Anyway, back at Leicester, um, having, I should have said, um, having our first priority to look at solar X radiation, and this was a, this was a program linked with UCL, where they provided most of the space engineering, and we, we did the detectors and, and basically ran the science. Um, but when this new, other new discovery was made, we actually w we carried on for several, uh, for the rest of the 60s actually, supporting solar experiments on satellites like orbiting Solar Observatory, NASA, the first ESRO satellite, ESRO 2. But back in Leicester, we knew then that we, we wanted to change that priority. We were no longer really interested in the sun from this perspective. <laughs> And we wanted to follow, find out more about these mysterious um, uh, stellar sources. So you can see that on the left, uh, that, was, that relates to the first attempts we made, because having Skylark launched from Woomera meant that we had first access to looking at the Southern Hemisphere sky. And so uh, Bryn Cook in particular and colleagues at Leicester instrumented four skylarks over the period 67, 8 and 9 to just scan around the southern sky at night time and see what we could see. That one there um, was one of the larger ones, um, Skylark 723, which you see there being t checked out at BAC because British Aircraft Corporation, as was at the time, they'd taken over from Palmborough and there, it, the young chap on the left happens to be the chap sitting there on the second row, Roger Cooper, who probably knows now as much about Skylark from a practical point of view as anybody around. So we were into that and we got some fascinating results from those, we, those flights. We, we probably added another dozen sources to this my mysterious group of stellar sources, but no one knew s still what, what were they. So we needed better data, and that meant really we've got to go into orbit. We've got to put X-ray experiments into orbit. And again, Ariel, the Ariel program came to our rescue, and the fifth one, Ariel 5, 74 to 80, as you can see, that was filled with X-ray instruments, and there were experiments from Birmingham Imperial, NASA Goddard, UCL and Leicester. And happily for us, the by far most productive instrument on board was the Sky Survey instrument, again led by Bryn Cook, which scanned the sky. Oh, sorry, I, I slot, slotted this one in this morning, so just a minute on this. Having given up our partnership with UCL, who provided the engineer? We needed to build up our own ex engineering expertise. So this is just an indication of how we were able to do that by bringing young people in quite a lot from the local industry because local industry at that time in, in Leicester, I, there was a lot of light engineering. There were some good apprenticeship schemes. And so we were able to build up a, a really good technical group. And what you see there quickly from the left is uh, Barry Giles, a research student, Roger Cooper again, uh, or second left, Rod Roy Daldorf, a local electronics technician, who we hoped might come, but we couldn't get in touch with him. And then on the right, the chap um, that you've probably heard of in different contexts, that was Jeff Hoffman, who was a research fellow who came from Harvard to work with us for a few years. And then, of course, went back to NASA became an astronaut, and he was one of the two spacewalkers that actually saved the Hubble telescope. So he did NASA a big, big favor there. Jeff is still in touch, uh, and I, I, I think it would have been great to get him over here, but he will be coming at some point. Anyway, quickly to what we achieved with uh, Ariel 5. Well, first of all, we did a sky survey, which discovered over 250 sources, so we'd multiplied the number known by a factor of 10. That's a sky map, map in, in galactic coordinates, and, and I particularly point out to one of them, um, which I can't actually 
see there, but the, one of them was in fact this famous stellar black hole, which, is, which goes by the name of AO620-0, which is just the RN deck of the source, which remains the best determined black hole that anybody has ever seen, stellar black hole that is, and it is the one that is about to receive a message from Stephen Hawking that was actually sent at the time of his internment at Westminster Abbey. Um, I say about to receive, well it's 2,000 light years away so it's going to be a little while before the message gets there. But from the better position on the sky and from the time variability we were able to monitor on these sources, we did get a much better idea what they were. It was clear many of them were in binary systems, as indeed AO620 was. And, and so the, basically the reason why they are so powerful X-ray emitters is that they're driven by gravity rather than by nuclear fusion, as a normal star would be. And gravity, strong gravity, is the most efficient way of getting energy out of matter, which I'm sure you all know. Anyway, moving on, um, I've got to show this actually for domestic reasons in that when, we, when we'd finished with Ariel 5, which I think is fair to say was the mission that first put Leicester on the international map, we then managed to persuade Europe, or Ezra at the time, that they ought to get into X-ray astronomy. And this was their first eventual X-ray satellite called Exosat, 83 to 86. Main detector array came from Leicester with electronics from MPE. We, we actually managed to get 30% of all the observations over the three years of the mission, because basically we got in early, um, you know, using the argument that, well, if we've helped to build it, you should get a little bit of a head start. So I'm sure you all do that. I say domestic reasons there, and <laughs> the, the young lady sitting, sitting on the uh, testing rotation table actually became my wife. Um, and can't be here today because she decided to get COVID a few days ago. Don't worry, she was up in near Newcastle and I was down in Leicester, so you can't catch COVID by text, I gather, so. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, that was then a period we're talking about, eight, the 80s and the 90s, when the UK national programme was, was ended funding, you know, the UK government of that habit of when anything is looking really uh, successful, they stop it. So what we did, however, having established a bit of a re reputation in, in building effective X-ray detectors, we were invited to join Japan in their next X-ray satellite, which you see there on the left, a satellite called Ginga. And some really great experiences out of Ginga. It, it flew from 87 to 1990. It was a true collaboration in which all the data was shared. And more, more than that, we sent graduate students from Leicester to Tokyo. They sent Japanese students to the ones who could speak English anyway, to Leicester. Uh, I, I mean, I know you don't really need to speak English in Leicester, but, you know, as, as near as some of us can do. And that was a great, a great mission that we all enjoyed and we did a couple of other things like that over that period before I get to basically almost the end of what I'm going to say and I now have to miss out quite a bit and I say fast forward to where we are now. Well in X-ray astronomy which is only as I mentioned earlier part of what we do at the university now because in space we also have a significant Earth observation program and a significant planetary observation. But in high energy astrophysics, X-ray astronomy is what we do. And right now, there are, as you probably know, two missions operating. There's ESA XMM Newton, which for me is the best X-ray mission that's ever flown. Brilliant. It's produced great data to keep me off the streets for the last 20 years. And then SWIFT, which is something that Alan had a lot to do with and might mention a bit later on, which is a really 
really neat um, NASA satellite in which Lester have got a role. And then finally then, looking ahead, I've mentioned already that we now have a broader program at the university. And finish with this slide, which I could be part of the vision of Space Park, in that that's the astrophysics class at Leicester in 1998, where on the front, on, the, on your right at the front row, the, the, the red-haired guy, that's Will Marshall. Will Marshall is one who decided that there wasn't enough opportunity in Leicester at the time, there was no space park, so he just bunked off to NASA, and he and a colleague at NASA later on left NASA and set up a company in San Francisco, which is now Planet Lab. Now, some of you will know about Planet Lab. If you don't, just go on to Google. Planet Lab is a remarkable uh, organization in which their, their product, if you like, is a, a, a map of the whole Earth at four meter resolution in either visible light or infrared um, twice a day. Just think, you know, having a, a whole Earth picture twice a day, the, the civil and military applications of that are just fantastic. And just finally, a point I like to make for the university marketing people, um, will put this Planet Lab on New York Stock Exchange um, just before Christmas, and it's um, now worth three and a half billion. So why the university didn't choose him to be one of our 100, uh, along with old people like me, I, I'll never know. The other end, by the way, obviously it's quite a long time ago, because I'm obviously able to comfortably rest on my knees. <laughs> After 58 years of active football, I had to get that one in. So, f to finish off then, I think that picture underlines why maintaining the, a close link between the university and this place is so important, I think, because that's where the new blood is going to be. That's where, not, not uniquely of course, but a lot of the new ideas are going to come from. So, just as we found years ago in setting up the Space Centre on campus, even being 300 yards apart is a, is a challenge. Now, you're about three miles apart, so I think it is so important to find a way, maybe you've already found it, I'm not sure, of maintaining that, that close link. And then finally, since it, we had a great time, so many people I speak to that worked with us over the years have said it's the best time of their lives. And uh, so good luck, enjoy the ride, as, I, as I've said, and I hope you all have as much fun as we did. Well, I was appointed as the first director to Space Research Centre actually in 1994. So there's a big gap in the story from where Ken left off to where I'm picking up. Uh, but it wasn't until 98 that before we were able to move into the move all our space hardware program into the new building, and at the same time provide a permanent home for the newly formed uh, Earth Observation Science Group. Um, the idea of the uh, Space Research Centre actually came about in the 1980s and that was obviously stimulated by the success of the X-ray astronomy programme that Ken has been speaking about. Uh, but the idea behind it was also to plan for the future space and scientific challenges by acquiring new technologies and developing new skills and expertise especially in space systems design and the technology and the engineering that goes behind supporting these space um, experiments. And over the following years, so through the 1990s till about 2005 when I moved on, um, our growing program realised many benefits from having 
the Space Research Centre. The new building and its facilities help to create a coherent and interactive and well-equipped working environment which was really important in, um, in, in taking our programme forward. Um, I haven't got too long to, to make this presentation, so I'm going to really skip through, not take every programme step by step. It's not by intention, but just to really give you a bit of a flavour of the timeline of the things that we were involved in, in this period that I'm covering, really, 1990 onwards. So, um, Ken has mentioned um, XMM Newton. That was born uh, in, the, uh, in the 1980s, following on from Ginga and Exosat and, uh, and other new uh, developments which I'm going to really touch on as we go forward. Um, in addition to that, um, what, what, what I think the theme I want to make here is that these programs, both in international space science, uh, uh, high profile as they are, and also space applications programs, what we have really followed as a mantra is adapting results from innovative laboratory research and incorporating advanced technologies into those, it, those inventions. Partnership with, in, it, with industry has always been important and then delivering reliable, long-lasting, uh, scientifically competitive instrumentation and, and equipment. And the scientific re uh, returns from uh, missions like XMM and SWIFT uh, instruments that we built uh, and um, were launched even two decades ago still continue to support prolific scientific research in Leicester and other research, in, uh, research institutes uh, globally. <clears throat> but I also want to mention three operational Meteosat spacecraft which carry uh, the Leicester built sensor in the GERB instrument. That's glo Global Earth Radiation Budget which is continuing uh, today, still monitoring the Earth's radiation budget and global warming. And that step for us was to take expertise from one field in X-ray astronomy sensors and carry it over into uh, an infrared uh, sensor which went into and formed the core of, of, of the GERB instrument that was mainly built by RAL and Imperial College. <coughs> The Space Research Centre also had a major role in the Beagle 2 mission to Mars, uh, building much of the instrument uh, uh, package, and Mark Sims, of course, provided the essential project management for taking, uh, taking on this complex project. The, as, as everybody knows, the, the final outcome scientifically uh, was, was uh, an unhappy exam uh, uh, experience of uh, that final step not quite working, but 10 years after Beagle 2 was uh, sent to Mars with a lot of work done in the background uh, with uh, other data from NASA's um, lunar uh, Mars orbiter. The eventual location of Beagle 2 was found and the best imagery that is available does clearly show that it was a soft landing and that the <coughs> um, uh, solar panels almost all deployed. There were just the one fourth panel didn't fully deploy which shielded the antenna underneath and explained the loss of the, the absence of signal that we suffered on Christmas Day that year and for several months afterwards while we tried to find out what had happened. It was a very sobering experience but not untypical of the challenges in a space program where not everything goes right all the time. Um, instruments recently launched on Bepi Colombo and the James Webb Space Telescope also have their origins in preparatory work that we were doing in the Space uh, Research Centre all those years ago when, when I was still involved. And yet here we are today just celebrating that those missions are now the next new science that we will be uh, receiving. So I want to just touch on a couple of the innovations behind the programs that we've, uh, that we've successfully delivered. And I'm talking about charge coupled devices because I was very much involved in that myself. Um, we had five PhD projects over the years, 
all of them funded by industry partners at GEC and later with EEV. And uh, these joint industry PhD projects helped to gain access to the electronic methods and the technology of driving the CCDs, also finding out what their limitations were, and then introducing changes to the industry technology to adapt those charge coupled devices to X-ray sensors instead of the optical, uh, the con more conventional use of them as, as optical sensors. <clears throat> and some of the funding came actually through ESA uh, and uh, a co-funded program actually with the Swedish Dental Research Institute, co-funded a program to develop space qualified CCDs at EEV and Leicester were part of that program with the responsibility for testing and calibration of the outputs from that from those new types of detectors. <clears throat> the Jet X telescope, another not very happy story I would say, um, was the first European telescope to consider using CCDs. And I'll say a bit more about Jet X in a moment. But the initial development of those detectors for the CC for, for Jet X expanded to become the core detectors on the XMM-Newton mission and, um, and then later the SWIFT telescope. So there is a chain of utilisation of the technology that's running through this. And the outcome I would say from this is that the X-ray CCD became the workhorse X-ray sensor for high energy astrophysics throughout the 1990s, still carrying on today 20 odd years after SWIFT and, and XMM were launched. Those CCDs are remarkably resilient. Some of them have degraded a little bit, but they're solid uh, for an emission that was only designed for two years and now in its 18th year, like, like SWIFT, for example, owes a lot to the resilience of these technologies that we put together back 20 odd years ago. On the other side of it, the story, <coughs> there's the uh, uh, the, the X-ray CCD has uh, rapidly became the dental industry's standard X-ray imager, uh, reducing the radiation dose uh, to patients by about a factor 20 compared with X-ray film that was previously used. As a footnote to that, in the early stages of this program, I was offered the IPR for uh, X-ray sensors by GEC who, who said we own the IPR of making the sensors, but we don't see any commercial value in X-ray uh, X ray versions of these. They're just for science purposes. So at the time, there wasn't a very established way of, uh, of getting ownership of IPR, but there was an organization called the British Technology Group who turned down our application for uh, IPR registration of, of the X-ray technology. If that had been differently, I wouldn't be standing here today. I might have a yacht in, um, in, in Monaco or somewhere, but it, it didn't happen. So uh, another, another not very successful outcome. So another uh, innovation that I want to refer to uh, is, I think, a very interesting story. Um, again, another range of PhD student projects in, in the 1980s uh, and even earlier than that, was the use of microchannel plate sensors for missions such as Einstein, ROSAT in 1990, and later on Chandra, NASA's X-ray, uh, large X-ray telescope, a, a contemporary of XMM. But in addition to that, and I think I've got a pointer here, um, the micro <coughs> this micro-pore technology was also employed as the lightweight collimators on the Exosat mission that Ken has also mentioned. Now, what that was supposed to do was using the channel plate to narrow the field of view of the X-rays coming in so that their pointing direction was well defined. Um, it didn't actually work like that because multiple reflections on the inner walls of these channel plates uh, led to the widening of the response function of the CCD, of, of the microchannel plate collimator. And it was Martin Turner and Alan Smith actually who doing the calibration on the 
exosat detectors that really found out what was going on here and then the response to it to restore the narrow field of view was to roughen up the inside of the of the microchannel pores but serendipity using these internal uh, reflection properties to make lightweight mirrors was the invention of our dear friend uh, <coughs> George Fraser along with Richard Willingale and they saw the benefit of using that technology which was uh, a, a nuisance to exosat to become a a, a new approach to x-ray reflection and focusing here and jumping on to the present day that technology is the core of one of these two telescopes on the, on the Mixis in, instrument on Bepi Colombo and a lot of that microchannel plate technology went from went through three different companies over the, over the years and the connection with the University of Leicester and George Fraser in particular um, carried that technology from Mallard in, um, in, in London initially that business was sold on to Philips in Eindhoven um, and then further finished up with pho Photonis in, uh, in Brive in France and that relationship s spreads over 25 or 30 years of many different ways of using these uh, channel plate optics um, in, uh, in, um, in, in these innovative solutions which have now uh, found their way onto the Bepi Colombo mission and I understand are also the core uh, focusing in, uh, element in new projects that the Space Research Centre is now carrying forward. So what about the methodology in the Space Research Centre? Well, I think system design and system engineering at the level that we can achieve that is the core to success, the technical success of the, of the scientific instruments that we have built over the years. But it, ca it carries with it a lot of different skills that have to be married together into a systematic approach to the development. I've listed some of those things there. We prototype uh, laboratory devices. We do the system engineering to bring the whole instrument concept into the space environment and, and make sure that we have a full end-to-end -end understanding of how this is going to work in space. You build it with very high standards of engineering respecting all the time the scientific performance that the principal investigator wants to achieve. So it's a trade-off at times and it's not always friendly but you do it. <coughs> then we have the integrated system that we put together, build it as a working instrument, test it, qualify it. We've been hearing this afternoon, shown this afternoon, uh, uh, outputs of vibration testing uh, using augmented reality to study that. I mean, that's an interesting step forward. Previously, you went and stuck sensors all over the thing, put the instrument in a truck and carried it halfway across the country and, and, and spent two or three days of anxious time shaking these instruments to see if they're going to survive. Sometimes they break and you come back and do it all again. I would say multidisciplinary team working is the key to this and that the management issues associated with these activities are an integral part of what you have to do as a successful system design and engineering group to take the whole gamut from cradle to grave essentially in space science. So um, uh, the picture there is, is a, a signal of triumph that the X-ray telescope was successfully installed on, on the SWIFT mission somebody uh, uh, very enthusiastic about that achievement. So um, what about this? Well, <coughs> I mentioned briefly JetX, the Joint European Telescope. That was developed for the USSR Spectrum X Gamma mission, uh, which actually signaled renewal of West Soviet Western cultural and scientific exchanges following the USSR's conflict in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Uh, goes down to Margaret Thatcher and, and Gorbachev meeting and, decide, and Margaret Thatcher said I can work with this man. Immediately following that there was a, a, a return meeting at foreign minister level 
in London, in which the um, uh, in which the, the Soviet side said we want to cooperate with the West, with the UK, in medicine, the arts, and space science. The Foreign Office official at that meeting turned to his advisor and said, "Do we do space science?" And the answer was, "Well, there are." three universities and the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory that do it. And immediately following that was the visit by Rashid Sunyaev that opened the door for this project. <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell on this because it's too painful, but the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, followed by the political upheaval and the severe reductions in the space uh, budget in, in Moscow, led us to withdraw from the Spectrum X Gamma Agreement but in 1990, so it was, a big, it was a long time when we were trying to work with the, the, uh, the, the, the Russian side to keep this mission alive, to keep it um, in the minds of the changing administrations in both the UK and, um, and, and, and in Moscow. So, we did withdraw from it finally in 1999. The JETEX instrument had been fully completed, tested, calibrated, and was stored in the Space Research Center clean room. It finally reached a low altitude geospatial orbit in 2010 as the centerpiece of the Cosmos and Culture exhibition on the second floor of the Science Museum in London. They have I, I'm, I, could, I could be offended that there was a notice in front of this that says this is the highest the, the, this, uh, this instrument ever reached. But in the meantime, you know, this is a good news, bad news story, or it's bad news, good news story. It, by 1998, we'd responded to NASA's call for proposals for the mission to solve the problem of gamma ray bursts. And we offered, essentially, the X-ray telescope that essentially used the, the JETEX design and even used the flight spare mirrors from JETEX. Um, and we, we built that instrument in a relatively short period of time. And for a mission that had a two, a, an 18, a, a two year mission design lifetime, it's now in its 18th year. And so in the picture here on the left, is the is the jet the jet x telescope in the science museum on the right is the x-ray telescope on the nasa neil gerald's swift gamma ray burst mission and it still is producing wonderful science i think tracking gamma ray bursts alongside an extensive observational program of x-ray and optical um, as, as, astronomy i want to talk a bit about education and outreach we have many joint ventures between the National uh, Space Centre and the University Space Research Centre. Uh, the National Space Centre received funding approval for its proposal in 1998 from the Millennium Commission. There was a condition in that approval that the National Space Centre would be a showcase for the University's space research programme a showcase to the visiting public. And I think this pledge has been honoured many times. <clears throat> uh, th there have been many joint ventures between the National Space Centre and the University Space Research Centre, as well as confusion at times about the titles. But I'd list here the Challenger Learning Centre in, in 1999, the Beagle 2 Mission Operations Centre in 2003-2004, uh, which I think is a prime example of where we located the Beagle 2 Mission Control Centre in NSC, in the National Space Centre. And this was the first time ever that a space mission had operation had been managed from a public science centre. NASA, f fairly soon after that, followed suit. Um, and I contend, I don't know whether Chaz would agree with me, I don't think he does actually, but I, I contend that visitor numbers at the National Space Centre surged during the period we had the mission uh, operations science team actually in the space, uh, National Space Centre behind uh, a, a glass panel running 
all the test programs for Beagle 2. <coughs> we also um, had launch coverage at the National Space Centre of ROSAT, XMM, Mars Express, SWIFT and Bepi Colombo. And in addition to that, the National Space Academy, well, the Space Academy was launched in 2008. And I think we've seen consistently throughout all of this a complementarity between the Space Academy and the university's outreach work in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, sort of complementary way. But that takes me on then to training and career progression. And I've got a quote here from our current Vice Chancellor, um, uh, where he's just recently been addressing the question of technical training. And I found this very interesting. His quote, the quote I've listed is, as you see, it is, however, important to emphasise that the university research strength is the outcome of collaborative efforts delivered by broad research teams, yes, in which technicians play a vital role. <coughs> Trained technicians and graduate engineers in the Space Research Centre are and have been vital members of Space Research Centre project teams. The expertise acquired from the hands-on experience as well as the formal education and training are of equal importance, I would argue. But for people in the, in the technical um, and, and uh, oh, sorry, in, in, the, in the technical uh, area, I think there are difficulties in terms of career pathways, and I have to say that. Um, <clears throat> some of our most illustrious techni technical team members over the years started life in apprentices, or in apprentice type roles, um, even at, in the university. Uh, with on-the-job training in departmental workshops and day release to obtain technical qualifications. I would say, however good they were, their career prospects in the university environment were actually quite limited, and promotions in particular were very hard to get. Now, we had to work very hard to properly respect and pay appropriate uh, give appropriate career opportunities to our, our technical teams and I, I, I suspect that is not a problem that's been fully solved uh, over the years. Now the National Space Academy launched a post-16 space engineering course with Loughborough Colleges a few years ago and that offers A-level and BT, B-Tech qualifications as pathways for people who may not always have got on the right ladder educationally to the university to university courses and this this is pretty successful it is um, I think Chaz told me it's probably 80 or 90 people who over the years have been through this program and have found employment in the aerospace industry not the space industry the aerospace industry and have found their way onto uh, successful uh, engineering courses in, in, in good universities. In parallel with that, at National Space Centre, we tried to launch uh, a similar programme for space apprenticeships, and that was of very limited, had very limited success and has not been continued. Now, I, I would argue that the new facilities here on Space Park Leicester are outstanding. I'm not sure if I'm right, but there would appear to be a skill shortage in the kind of highly specialised areas that you're working in and where you need to not just, you need to grow and sustain that technical capability to use these facilities that you've, you've acquired. And I'm just asking the question really, are there opportunities here for the apprentice style on the job training for the next generation of space technologists where these facilities can actually be used with young people coming in and integrating into the exciting space technology programs that you, that you are working with. My experience of working with young people is always that the enthusiasm that they bring is worth an awful lot compared with the 
extra bit of mentoring that you have to put in to get the, get the good results. And I would say, with that question in mind, it's worked before. And uh, as I said, some of, our, some of our most capable engineers and technicians in the past have actually come through that route in the past, but the apprenticeship type scheme seems, has for a number of years been less available but it now has a political flavour. So I'd be interested to talk to anybody <coughs> about that route for the National, for, for the Space Research Centre in the, uh, in, it, as you occupy this building and start using these wonderful facilities. So I'm coming to a conclusion, you're probably pleased about that. <coughs> the university investment in its first Space Research Centre in 1994 I think has paid enormous dividends. I'm not going to put any monetary value on it, but we've had some big, input, uh, big money inputs into the university from these programs. The investments in the new facilities here will surely create many more new and exciting opportunities. And that's not only in Leicester's traditional scientific centres of excellence in astrophysics and Earth observation science. The new uh, Space Research Centre positions Leicester to be able to respond to many new challenges in climate change mitigation, planetary exploration and the commercial applications of space technology. That includes data and services and all those things are clearly coming over the horizon. Your time is now, I mean it, it is, it, you're beautifully positioned for that. <coughs> As I've just said, I also think there's a new, new opportunities in relation to education and training uh, for the space sector by adding the technological resources of this place to the already vibrant programs in space-oriented STEM education programs that are at the university and at the National Space Centre. So my closing remark is that the University of Leicester Space Research Centre <coughs> has a, a really exciting future ahead with many possible pathways and I do congratulate Mark and his team with what they've built here. I'm in awe. Thank you.